Okay, thank you. So welcome back to this uh, second lecture of Mental Games. Uh, so in this afternoon, we, we are going to discuss the following two main things. The first one is what I'm going to call the potential case, which is a way to make the connection between uh, minfield games, as we saw this morning, and uh, minfield control or optimal control of mapping as of diffusion processes. And uh, you will see the connection exactly at this uh, notion of potential games. And the second one is, or the second thing that we are going to study is the notion of mental games with common noise. And you will see that, in fact, this is more difficult uh, to prove existence of a solution. This is a bit more difficult, and I will tell you why, and possibly some strategies. And then uh, I will address a very last uh, question today, which is absolutely central now in uh, in papers about mental games, which is the notion of master equation. In fact, if you remember what we said this morning, we said that when you had a forward backward system in finite dimension, you could regard this system as the system of characteristics of some nonlinear PDs. And the example I gave you was burger system. And in fact, you have exactly the same for mental games, meaning that when you have a mental game, you can regard the forward backward system that you have as the characteristics of a PD set on the space of probability measures. And this is absolutely a crucial object that is absolutely fascinating. And this is what we call the master equation. So what I'm going to say is based on, on joint works with the same people at this, uh, as this morning. Um, so potential games. Um, the very purpose of this section is to make a connection between minfield control, as I discussed very shortly this morning, and minfield control and minfield games. And potential gain is a class of minfield games for which, in fact, you have that a minfield game, said very shortly, is the Pontryagin system of a minfield control. You will see that it says that the equilibria that you have, or within the equilibria that you have, you may have minimizers of a problem that is set on the top of your minfield game. So I'm going to, to, to recall you first things that I did, or I mentioned very quickly this morning about the country again principle. I know that I was a bit short about this uh, this morning, but I will spend a bit more of time, a bit more time now on this on this question. And this is uh, for those of you, uh, and many of you know this uh, control theory. This is a way to characterize, not characterize, but this is a condition, a necessary condition for uh, for optimality in control theory. And uh, this is what I'm going to recall you now. So <clears throat> forget for the noise in, in the dynamics uh, of one particle. And you, you, you just have a look at one, uh, one particle that follows uh, a velocity field that is driven by X, mu if you want. So mu is the same as, as this morning and alpha, which is the control. And you want to, to minimize uh, this, this cost. So the expectation might be a might look strange, but you may think of, a, of a, a random initial condition. In any case, what happens is that you may have a look at the first order condition. So you take a minimizer if it does exist, and you try to get a zero of the derivative. This is exactly what you have in the, when you try to minimize a function uh, in R, you say that at any minimizers, you know that uh, the derivative has to be equal to zero. But for sure, this is, a, this, is a, this, this is the way you get critical points. This is a necessary but not sufficient condition. And you would, you would like to do the same here for, for control theory. And once again, this is the Pontryagin principle. So the very general shape of it is as follows. So you say that the optimal trajectory when alpha star minimizes the Hamiltonian. So you have to remember the definition of the Hamiltonian. Once again, I was a bit short of this this morning. So the Hamiltonian is the velocity field times a dual variable or an adjoint variable that I'm going to call Z and I call this Z this morning plus the running cost. And remember that this morning, the role played by Z was mostly DXU. So this was made mostly the derivative of the value function. And in the FBSD formulation, I, I was, I explained to you that there was another interpretation of the Z in terms of 
the forward backward system. So once again, you can regard this as a possible other explanation of what I said in this section this morning. And so once you have the, the Hamiltonian, you have to remember that alpha star is a minimizer. Uh, the black box is going to disappear in a, in a few seconds. So alpha star is the minimizer of, of the Hamiltonian. So this is the minimizer over the parameter alpha when you freeze x, mu, and z. Okay. So this is the, the local minimizer or the minimizer of your Hamiltonian. And then what you say as a critical condition that you have, you say that the optimal trajectory necessarily satisfies this forward backward system. So once again, as an optimal control, you choose alpha star of X, which is your, your state, mu, which is the environment, and Y, which is in fact the dual variable. So the dual variable is very connected to the derivative of the Hamilton, uh, of the solution to the Hamilton Jacobi equation this morning. But here you have another description, and this is in terms of the derivative of the terminal cost and the derivative of the Hamiltonian. So once again, this is what I said. This was a bit quick this morning, but this is another explanation of it. And you know that y, the y that you plug here in the forward equation is in fact is exactly given as the solution of this backward ordinary differential equation. Now this is completely deterministic and, and this makes uh, things slightly easier for the, the reason is that there is no noise in the, in the dynamics. This, this is a choice that I did, and you will see why I did this choice. So there is no noise, and so this is certainly, there is no way to penalize the dynamics by mean of an additional stochastic integral to force the solution to be, uh, to be non anticipated So this is easier than what I did this morning. So once again, there is no here, there is no uh, um, stochastic integral. So, so this is easier. Okay, so this is this is the equation for, for optimality. And so you have the terminal boundary condition, the derivative of the cost, and as velocity field, you have the derivative of the Hamilton. So this is what we said, but this is once again when there is no noise. And this is a necessary condition, which means that if you have an optimal trajectory, then it satisfies this country again principle. Okay, now just to be consistent, this is not exactly what I want to say, but just to be consistent with what I did this morning, assume that you have a main field game in which there is no noise in the dynamics, then one possible way to study the, uh, the equilibria is to replace mu by the law of the solution, the law being computed with respect to the randomness that you have in the initial condition. I'm not going to use that, but this is just to remind you of the shape of the Pontryagin principle, because this is exactly what I'm going to use next in infinite dimension. Okay. Now, yes, maybe this is one computation that some of you would be happy to do uh, just to give you or to show you the way it works. Um, this is a very standard example that you can find in, in the literature. Maybe this would be, this is a good idea for me to explain a little bit this computation. This is what people call linear quadratic mean field games. This is the case when the dynamics are completely linear and also linear in the measure in the sense that what you see as aggregated quantities is the mean state of the population. So this is for the dynamics and the costs are quadratic, meaning that you see somehow a square of these quantities. So you see that B, the drift, is linear in X, linear in the measure. So this is a very bad notation, but just you, you see what it means. This is the mean of the measure. And you have linear in alpha. And then the, the cost is quadratic and the running cost is quadratic as well. So this is a very standard model in optimal control. And here the, the only thing is that you, you add a layer of interaction through the mean state of the population. In mean field game theory, this is what people call linear quadratic mean field games. And there are plenty of papers about it. And usually what people do is that they use this as a kind of benchmark to see the way it works, to test some algorithm or whatever, what you want. But this is very useful to make the analysis. And the very nice thing is that since everything is quadratic, when you compute the, 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 the Pontryagin system, you just have to take derivatives. And so you, you, you get something that is linear. And so it makes the analysis very simple at the, at the, at the level of the, of the Pontryagin system. So this is an exercise that you can do. You can easily compute 
the optimizer of the of the Ham, of the Hamiltonian just because this is a quadratic functional and so this will be very easy to compute what is the the optimizer what I call alpha star in the previous slide and when you take when you formulate what is the country again system in the previous uh, in the previous line uh, so here I was uh, I was not very uh, sympathetic for you because I restore the presence of sigma but you can ch choose sigma is equal to zero and then you remove z and this will be absolutely the same for the analysis then you take expectation in the forward you have a forward equation you have a backward equation and when you compute when you replace the dependence on the measure by the unknown itself this is the way or this is the system that you have so this is the Makin Vlasov forward backward system that you have for a linear quadratic mean field game. And you see that this is purely linear. And so the way you do that, if you want to, to, to try by yourself to, to see the way it works, to solve this equation, for sure you benefit from the linearity. And you just take expectation of the solution on both sides on the first line and on the second line and on the third line as well. And you get the forward backward system for the mean itself. And now the question is, what do you know about the solvability of this equation? This is a bit more subtle than what we did this morning for Schauder, because for Schauder, I told you that we need or we needed compactness. And the way we got or we can get compactness for Schauder theorem is typically by requiring some bounds on the coefficient so that we know that necessarily we have, uh, we control the tails of the distribution that we have uniformly in the inputs. In the case where things are linear quadratic, this is a bit more subtle to control the tails, and you may face some, some difficulties. So something that is very, very nice to study this is to say, well, when I have this forward backward system, I regard this as the Pontry again system of a completely standard uh, uh, optimal control problem. So I have a Pontry again forward backward system, and I say, oh, I have a forward backward system for the expectation. It's completely deterministic. And I want to say, well, maybe this could be, or I could identify this with a system of this type for some Hamiltonian, for some cost G, and for some, so for some running cost F. So I end up with E as being, or the expectation of X and Y as being the solution of a deterministic system. And I'm saying, well, maybe this is going to be the optimal trajectories of a minimization problem directly that is set on the expectation itself. And the reason why I'm saying that is the question is to interpret this solution as the minimizers of another problem. And if this other problem has nice convex feature, then you know that there exists a unique solution to this country again system. Country again is a necessary condition, but if you have a lot of convexity behind, then it becomes necessary and sufficient condition, and that you and then you have existence and uniqueness to the country again system. And this is exactly what I'm saying here. In fact, if you have a sign property on M and M prime and QQ prime. I'm not going to remove this. Sorry. So this is the same for Q and Q plus Q prime. So you have this sign condition. Necessarily, I'm saying that this system that you have derives from a kind of convex functional, a convex optimal control problem, and then you have existence and uniqueness. So my message here is, is twofold. This is just a way to show you how to implement country again in the simple case when you have linear quadratic. And this is also a way to bypass any uh, monotonicity or very general monotonicity criterion. You use a kind of monotonicity because you have, in the end, convexity. So this is a way you see that you recover some 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 convex properties. But this is completely formulated here in a, in another manner. Uh, so an uh, NMM prime. These are the coefficients that you have here in the formulation of the cost, and the same uh, for for Q and uh, for Q and Q prime. So G depends on, on Q and Q prime. So this is a very easy exercise that you can do independently of what I did this morning. You, you, you do all the computation directly. And I think that this is a very basic example. I know that some of you have, have to write a, a small report about the, the lectures. You can, do, you can do this as an exercise to illustrate uh, the way it works. This is, this is a possibility. So back to my, to my discussion. Now, I would like to do the same for MFGs. There are two things here. I said I can use Pontry again 
to compute uh, what is uh, or to compute a mean field gain equilibrium but now i'm going to do more i'm going to say in fact in some situations a mean field gain itself in a very general formulation is a contrarian system of a mean field of a control problem on the space of probability measures so this is not exactly what i said before but this is connected through the notion of contrarian in the first slides i used contrarian to solve the mfg now i'm going to use contrarian to give another interpretation of the mean field gain so back to uh, to our very general uh, formalism so remember that what i said this morning is that mean field control so this is no longer mean field gain i told you mean field control so this is one slide that we saw this morning you take the same general dynamics as before the drift is controlled and in the dynamics of the drift you have the empirical measure of the state and any uh, any agent any player in the population receives a cost that is denoted by j uh, by j i and i assume that there is a central planner that says to all these people okay use the same strategy the same feedback function alpha which is exactly what i do here and then i want to optimize the population with respect to alpha question what is the contrarian system of this control problem and then what we are going to see is that in fact behind the country again for this problem is going to be a mean field game and this will be the connection between mean field control and mean field game and this is very interesting to have this connection because it gives or it can give more information about uh, a mean field game itself so uh, let me try to, to 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 explain to you the way it works so this is one slide that i have not uh, discussed this morning this is the asymptotic formulation of the social optimization so by social optimization or by central planner this is basically the same i'm saying that in the particle system all the particles play the same feedback function so that they, they play the same strategy the chiefs the chief has decided of the strategy and all the particles play the same strategy but they are submitted to different shocks to different noises and so they, are, they, they don't have exactly the same the same trajectories because of the realization of the noise that you have so what could be the asymptotic formulation now this is this is somewhat easier the difference with mean field game is that you take the mean field limit you take the mean field limit for any given alpha which means that you take once one uh, one uh, feedback function here and you say i am going to choose a feedback function alpha that only depends in fact on alpha xi and um and the empirical distribution so i don't know if i put this on this slide i'm sorry i don't remember exactly no i didn't put this so sorry about that so i was a bit fast in writing my slide so i should say that when i say alpha i is alpha i should say that alpha in fact so maybe this is a good point to to see whether you can see the ball using the just one 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 equation i think the camera is, is so i'm saying that I'm, I'm going to choose for player i i'm going to choose alpha t x t i nu bar and t when i say that in fact they all use the same can you see that i'm not sure it's your, but it's in the okay this is the only thing i wanted to write so this is the same alpha but this is not exactly the same feedback function when i said that i was a bit cheating there is a permutation meaning that there is one dominant player which is xi and then you see the rest of the population that is encoded by means of the empirical distribution so now when you have when you choose one alpha one feedback function you say that the players follow a standard particle system driven by alpha you pass to the limit on this so you take the mean field limit for any given alpha and in the end what you want to do is to maximize or to minimize to optimize with respect to the choice of alpha so this is what i mean here by alpha i is equal to alpha i was a bit sloppy in the in the in the writing of this uh, of this condition so asymptotically now i think that this is quite clear for you that when I do this 
when I, I, I focus here on XT, this is one typical player in the population. So this is the weak limit of any of the particles. And statistically, uh, I know that asymptotically, I get this equation. So X is the state of the particle. And I have replaced the empirical measure by the theoretical measure. And I am playing some strategy. And I have the knots. And I do the same in the in the uh, in the cost functional. I want to minimize the cost to one player, but this is the same as the cost to the society because statistically they behave in the same manner because they work or they have chosen the same feedback function up to this permutation that I was uh, I, I was just mentioning on the on the board. So it means that now in the cost functional you have replaced exactly the empirical distribution by the low of the by the law of the uh, of the particle itself so you see that somehow you you put the, the mean field limit before in, in the mean field game you have the candidate mu you optimize and then you have the fixed point here you do the mean field limit and then you optimize next so that there is a kind of non non commutativity in the story this is this is this could be a way to summarize things so you have this and alpha is the control of one typical player and you have to think as alpha t as being uh, as being of the shape alpha t x t i as I, as i explained to you you could say what about the mu t what about the the empirical measure i don't see the empirical measure and this alpha well in fact the empirical measure now this is completely deterministic so this is encoded to the time dependence of alpha upon time so this is for free i can say well alpha depends on mu t or i can say no this is just a function of time this is absolutely the same um, and what I'm going to do is now to optimize this cost functional with respect, with respect uh, to uh, to these dynamics. And the dynamics are Mackin Vlasov or a mean field in the sense that uh, inside you have the law of uh, you have the law of the particle. There is a PDE formulation for this. The PDE formulation is to say that you have here the law of XE that is mu t and mu t evolves according to a Fokker Frank equation so now i absolutely must remove uh, this one i know that okay i have to show you where this is so this is this uh, this bottom slide so here you see this is the Fokker Frank equation that you have here um and this is a way to refresh this is another formulation of your optimal control problem so let me, I have to do the same, the same manipulation as before to, to restore the slides. Okay, so behind this, uh, this uh, button that I'm not able to remove, you have the Fokker Frank equation. This is just to say that you can reformulate this optimal control over Mackinder's of equation as an optimal control over Fokker Frank equations. So depending on your testes, you might prefer the probabilistic formulation or the PDE formulation. Those of you who know optimal transportation, should be quite familiar with this formulation. In the Benamou, Benamou Brunier formulation of optimal transportation, you have very, very similar things. Uh, this is not exactly stated in this way, but this is not that far. So, meaning that you want to optimize uh, uh, the kinetic energy uh, from a one uh, uh, initial state to a terminal state. So, meaning that at the end of time, you penalize or you put that the cost is infinite if you don't reach exactly the target uh, that you want to reach. So, this is in fact certainly you could reset this. Um, uh, in connection with uh, with um, with optimal transport, there is another difference: is that in optimal transportation there is no sigma square. Uh, so maybe we could discuss exactly what it means or remove uh, sigma in uh, in the equation. But this is very very similar to the Benamou uh, Brunier formulation of uh, of optimal transportation. Um, okay, now I have a, an optimal control problem. What about trying to get the Pontry again principle? This is uh, this is a question. So. If you want to do that, you say, well, uh, I'm going to choose a kind of simple cost structure. This is to make easier the derivation of the, the Poncher again principle. So you see that I choose little g and little f as being convolution. Or this is a kind of inner potential energy given by convolution uh capital g or convolution kernel capital g and capital f so you see that i choose a very very specific structure for the cost for little f and little g and so what i'm going to say really depends on the choice that i did 
for the cost coefficient of little f and little g. And if I generalize, maybe I won't be able to generalize in any manner if I have any g or any f. And so what would be the formal Hamiltonian of the potential of the, of the mean field control that I have? So what is the, uh, the Hamiltonian? So the Hamiltonian, this is the action of the velocity field acting on a dual variable plus the running cost. So let me see where the running cost is in the story. So the running cost here, I'm claiming that this is exactly at this level. So I have the, the, the control and this is integrated with respect to mu, okay? And here, this is, um, this is the energy, the interaction energy between two clouds of particles uh, driven by the same, the same mu. So this is exactly what I have as a running cost. If I choose in my optimization problem now is if I'm replacing little f by capital F. So I'm saying that in this problem, I'm really seeing the running cost as being exactly this energy. So this is an energy. You see, I am given just mu, which is the state of the population. And I see the interaction between two clouds, the energy of interaction between two clouds of the same population of the same distribution. And for the for the kinetic energy, this is the, the feedback. And I take the mean energy of the feedback under the population. And so I'm wondering about a mean field control where I, I, I use exactly this as a as a minimization, meaning that the reason is that when you if you prefer when you compute this expectation here, you can regard this. So F in F, you have one layer of integration. And since you reintegrate with respect to the law of X, you indeed have a double, a double integration. This is what I want to do here. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian, this is the running cost in my optimization problem. And for the action of the velocity field onto uh, the dual variable, I'm going to say that the, uh, the, the dual variable is a function. Okay, so now I am in infinite dimension and I say that the dual variable is a function. And I say the dual variable is going to act on the equation on the operator that is behind the black box. So basically this is minus the divergence B mu plus one half delta mu. And so by integration by parts, you see that this is exactly what you get. So this is the dual variable U that is acting on you. And once again, this one is the energy functional in your new control problem, mean field control, and this is the energy alpha. And now you say, well, formally, formally, the dynamics of the joint variable should satisfy or should be given by the derivative of the Hamiltonian. This is what you got in finite dimension, if you respect, if you, re if you remember. Uh, this was the com this computation I told you the dynamics of the dual variable is exactly given by minus the derivative of the Hamiltonian. And now you do the same and you say, well, I'm going to do the same. I compute the derivative of the Hamiltonian in the direction of the measure. So in the direction u. And I will get an equation for the dual variable, which is a function. This is an infinite dimension. And so if you take formally the derivative with respect to mu, so the very first one is to say, when mu is, uh, I forgot to say that, when mu is, is driven, is fixed, what is the minimizer uh, uh, with respect to alpha? And you see that in fact, you can pass this alpha square and the alpha dxu inside a common integral with respect to mu, and then you minimize with respect to alpha and you, 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 you find again, or you recover the fact that alpha star, so the, the best feedback is minus the derivative of the, of, the, of the dual variable, of the dual function. So this is to say that this is the minimizer of the Hamiltonian when you have fixed uh, mu. So this is the formally, this is what you expect. And now you say, okay, I take the derivative of the Hamiltonian in mu and I replace the value of alpha star by dxu. And so you get formally, you take, you say these are linear functional on the top line. This one is linear as well. This one is quadratic. And so I, I had the derivative, I had the derivative of the quadratic functional. I'm going to assume that F and G are symmetric uh, so that uh, there is no question of uh, 
uh, when, when you when you take the derivative, in fact, you do not worry about the sign of x minus y or min y minus x. This is completely symmetric. And so when you get formally the derivative in u, this is the equation you have. You have that the derivative of u, the derivative of the dual variable, is minus the derivative of this. So you get sigma squared delta x minus the derivative of the cost, and you get exactly uh, you get this uh, plus the dxu uh, squared. So I don't know why uh, uh, there should be a minus here. So this is my mistake. There should be a minus. Sorry about this. And here you have a minus the derivative of this uh, of this energy. And you get the HJB equation. You get the HJB equation that you have exactly if in, in the mean field game. I choose. So in the mean field game, I have to remove this one half. So when I take, when I pass from the mean field control to the mean field game, I have to remove this one half. So you remove the HJB equation that is in the mean field game. So you see that if you start with this, uh, with this choice in the mean field control, so I take little g and little f in the previous, in this problem, so this is really the mean field control, I take this little g and little f, I take the point three again, then I observe that I get a mean field control where I have exactly f with the, without the one half as running cost. So the conclusion of this computation, and, and I think that this is another simple computation that you could put in your report for those of you who have to do that, is exactly to, to see that you can pass from one mean field control to one mean field game just by writing formally the point three again principle. So this is a way. Uh, to make the connection uh, between uh, between the two. So this is the equation that we obtain for the joint variable, and so now this is uh, this is the shape of the mean field again. So here, this is what uh, I just told you. So the terminal boundary condition. This is by derivative I get g integrated with mu. So this is a little g of x here and mu. So this is the cost of the terminal cost in my mean field game. Okay, the quadratic the quadratic energy is the same, and for the running cost, this is what I told you. This is the same as before, except that by taking the derivative, I remove the one half because basically, in my mean field control, there was a square. So when I take the derivative of the square, I remove the one half. So keep in mind this story. Mean field control means, or uh, when you have the social optimization, you get mean field control. So you minimize over Fokker Planck equations. Uh, for those of you who know PDEs. And if you want to come back to mean field game, let's say that you take the point again system of this and you get the mean field game. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is very useful in mechanism design. And uh, there are some people uh, like Nadia who knows this uh, very well. So what you want to do is that you would like, you are a kind of uh, um, manager or, or, or a, a regulator, a public regulator, and you would like to achieve some goal for the society for instance if you think of energy consumption for people working in connection with udf you would like to to minimize the consumption of of, of the global uh, society to reduce the, the the emissions of carbon or, or things like this but you know that people individually they act in a quite selfish manner they, they don't really care about the global society they just care about themselves so you say i'm going to put a kind of mean field control problem on the society and I'm going to say, well, I take the derivative, the formal point three again, and it becomes a mean field game. And somehow I'm going to design the incentive, the incentives for my uh, for my individuals so that they play when they play the mean field game. In fact, they achieve the minimizer or one mi one possible minimizer of of the mean field control. So you see, you you have a global problem on the society. You switch to a mean field game. You tune the, the constraints of uh, the individuals in practice in the real life so that when they act, they play the mean field game at a selfish manner. But in fact, when they achieve uh, an, equili an equilibrium of the mean field game, they do not know it. But in fact, they achieve a minimizer of the, of the mean field controls. So, so they, they work for the society. And this is exactly what you, you call mechanism design, how you have to tune or to, uh, to put some constraints on the individuals so that globally, they reach a kind of global objective. They reach a global optimum for the whole population. 
So this is what we call optimal uh, mechanism design. And this is really an interesting question from the, from the practical point of view. Still, you have to be very careful because what I told you about the Pontryagin principle is that this was a necessary condition. This is not a sufficient condition. So when I say that this is a necessary condition, it means that if you have a minimizer of the minfield control, this is a solution of a minfield game. Now, the converse is not true, in fact. You may have solutions to the minfield game that are not minimizers, for sure, of the, uh, of the minfield control problem. So when I told you that you had a mechanism design so that people, when they play the minfield game, they find some equilibrium, and in fact, they achieve the minimizer of some problem that is above, I have to be careful because they could find an equilibrium which is not a minimizer. Now, this is a question of mass, and the, the problem, the practical question of mechanism design uh, remains completely meaningful. So keep in mind this, uh, this, uh, this discussion about uh, uh, mean field control and mean field games. There are plenty of connection between the two of them from the math point of view, and also from the, uh, from the practical point of view. Really, really, this is, uh, there is an interest uh, in those questions. Okay, so this, this was uh, one part about uh, uh, potential games. Now I'm going to switch to something else, so coming back to minfield games. Uh, these are minfield games with common noise. And I told you uh, in the very first introduction of this, uh, of this lecture that um, things are more difficult when you have a common noise in the story. Uh, very simply, very simply, why should it be more difficult? If you remember what we did this morning to solve a minfield game, we used a uh, Schauder theorem. But Schauder relies on compactness. And compactness means that, okay, that's fine. The, 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 the space you have is, uh, you know it quite well, and uh, uh, you know how to, to put on it a nice topology so that uh, um, you can achieve, uh, or you can achieve the condition in the Schauder theorem. The problem when you have a common noise is that the fixed point, as you will see, is set on a much, much wider space. Because what you want to achieve is not only a fixed point for the law of the population, but this will be for the law of the population for any realization of the common noise. And so it becomes a very, very big uh, fixed point problem. And when you try to implement directly Schauder theorem to solve the problem, you realize that you lose the needed uh, compactness properties that you use uh, in the setting that I had this morning. So I will tell you next that there are some ways to simplify by discretizing the problem to reduce the the size of the space, but it remains challenging. This is more challenging. The, the fixed point problem, as you will see, is set on a space that is, uh, that is much more complicated. So this is exactly what I'm going to tell you now. What does it mean now to have uh, uh, an equilibrium to a mean field game with a common noise? So as I just told you, the very first difference is that I'm going to regard um, randomized state of the population. So the state of the population at the equilibrium will be random. So now you think that you have two levels of randomness. You describe the randomness of one particle, this is the, the state of the population, and on the top of this, you randomize the state of the population. So, so it, becomes, uh, it becomes certainly uh, much more difficult. Uh, Throughout, what I'm going to do is to denote by capital D the common noise. And if you don't remember exactly what it means, it means that in the dynamics that I have for in the particle system, so this is back to the particle system, now you have two types of noises. And if you remember, this is what I told you this morning. There are these individual noises, which are independent, and they are acting at the level of the players themselves. And globally, the you observe some decorrelation between the, between the, between the players, but now, in addition to, I'm going to to add this common noise, and this common common noise is going to to remain asymptotically. So when capital N tends to infinity, all the particles are going to feel this common noise, and so I'm not I won't be able uh, to say that um, to say that uh, the particles become independent. So the very, very main question is when you try to reformulate uh, the, the asymptotic formulation of minfield game, you have to wonder about the meaning of the empirical of the empirical measure. 
if you think of what we did this morning, we did, oh, we said, okay, when there is no common noise, the particles asymptotically, they, they should decorrelate, and so we should have a law of large number. Now let me make the following on that. I'm going to say, if I freeze, if I freeze, in, in, the, in the probability, we should say, I make a conditioning. So when I freeze the realization of the common noise, well, somehow this could be exactly as before. Given the realization of the common noise, I should observe a kind of law of large numbers. So it means that in the end, I have a kind of conditional law of large numbers. So what I do expect is that asymptotically, the empirical measure of the system converges to a conditional law, which should be the conditional law of any particle in the system, of any one in the system, but conditional on the realization of the common noise. And so for another realization of the common noise, certainly the state of the population will be different. So this is the, the main difference between the, what we are doing now and, and what I did this morning. So for instance, when there is no alpha, when there is no alpha in this, uh, in this equation, if I remove alpha, you get exactly this as possible, uh, as natural candidate for being the asymptotic formulation. You replace, uh, and, and sorry, there should be xt here. This is not only x, but this should be xt. Uh, so you replace the empirical distribution by the conditional loop given the common noise. Okay, so you should not worry too much about the fact that this is uh, the realization given uh, the common noise up to the end of time or uh, uh, up to time t only. Uh, basically, this is the same because what, what's going next after little t, the increments will be independent of capital X, t, and so they, they don't really count for um, in the condition. So this is just a technical argument. You can forget it when you see uh, the conditional law of X t given b. This is given b up to the end of time or given b up to little t itself. This is exactly the same because the future increments, they will be independent of xt. So they, once again, they do not uh, account in the condition. So you can reformulate, you can reformulate uh, the definition of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a solution to a mean field game in the presence of a common noise. So, to avoid too many uh, complicated uh, notations, I decided here to simplify a little bit. So you see, uh, I chose a sigma that is equal to eta. I'm sorry, sigma and eta are constants, so there is no longer x and u. This is to simplify. You, you could formulate in a general manner, but I think that there is no interest. I just want to explain to you what is the impact of the common noise on the uh, on the analysis, and uh, there is no need at this stage to have very very general models. And uh, eta here, if you set eta is equal to zero, formally, you should recover the setting that we had this morning. So there is no common noise. So um, the role of eta in all the computations that are going next, that are going to appear next, is just to, to show you what is the impact of the common noise on the analysis. And if you set formally eta, if eta is equal to zero, then you should be able to recover uh, uh, the results or the equation that we got this morning. Um, I chose, uh, so B in a linear shape, so this is alpha, so alpha text value is not exactly in RK, this should be RD, so this is another typo. And B, um, at some point, uh, maybe I, I will take B is equal to zero, but let's say that for the moment, uh, I'm keeping this, this shape. And the reason why I choose alpha, to, the drift to be linear in alpha is to have uh, a minimizer of the Hamiltonian that is, uh, that is, pretty, that is pretty simple. Okay, so this is the dynamics, a little bit more, a little bit simpler than what we did this morning. Uh, but once again, uh, my uh, my objective is mostly to explain to you uh, um, the arguments and not to have the, the, the widest generality. Anyway, the principle is the same. You are given a candidate for being an equilibrium. So now I have to be careful with uh, what is uh, what is a candidate for being an equilibrium. So. Once again, these are states of the population, but these are random. So it means that this should be processes taking values in the space of probability measures. So you see that it becomes a little bit complicated, but anyway, this, this makes sense. So it means that mu t at any time t, this is a random state of the population. And when I say random, it means that it does not anticipate on the future of the noise. You always have this principle that 
in stochastic analysis, you don't see uh, what's going, uh, what's going, uh, what's coming next. And so uh, this is what I call here FD progressively measurable. But if you if you don't like this notion of progressively measurable, if you don't know it very well, just keep in mind that this is non-anticipative on the future of the mass. And now you do as as we did this morning. You say I am freezing you. I am given the dynamics of one type particle in the population. So this is the same as before. But now it seems to be very much the same, except that mu t is mu t is uh, is random. The two noises are independent. W and B, they are independent because uh, W, I, and B here, they are independent. So I should have this uh, independence. And I want to minimize the cost function also. Once again, I simplified a little bit the shape of the cost function to have an easier computation. And what I want to do is to say, well, if there is a unique minimizer to this problem for any given U, so once again, this is uh, what you have uh, this is behind this. So let's see what I'm able to do with this. Um, so this is the condition that you have here. So this is, you want mu t to be equal to the conditional law of x given the realization of the common noise. So let me, I can enlarge, is it small to enlarge this? Okay, so I think that now in the room everybody can see. So I really insist on this one. This is absolutely fundamental. This is the main, the main, the hot, uh, the hot point in the in this uh, in these slides. So the same as this morning, but once again this morning you didn't have the conditioning. This was the law of x t star. Now you say I have this uh, this uh, this common noise, and when I do the fixed points or when I do the the the, the, the mean field limits. Everybody sees in the same manner the fixed point, so there is a conditioning when I compute the uh, the optimal uh, the law of the optimal uh, trajectory. So let me come back to the uh, to the slides. So this was this condition that is uh, that is hidden on the uh, at the bottom line. So now you would like to address existence uh, possibly of a solution. So uh, this is what we did this morning by using a Schader theorem. Um, And what we did this morning is to address uh, existence uh, by uh, by studying or by using the PDE formulation, at least at the level of the uh, of the HJB equation. So uh, maybe before I discuss existence, maybe a few a few words indeed about the forward backward formulation. So this is a complicated slide. The reason is that I'm going to meet the PDE formulation that I had this morning and the probabilistic formulation. I'm going to keep the PDE formulation in the sense that I'm going to provide a Hamilton Jacobi equation for the minimization of the cost functional when mu is given. So this is a PDE. But the very bad point in this PDE is that the environment, which is mu, is now random. So it becomes a stochastic PDE. And the very bad point of this stochastic PDE is that this is backward. If you remember the, the story this morning, the HJB equation was backward. And as usual, you don't want to anticipate on the future of your noise. What does represent the value function? It's going to be the remaining cost. So this will be the remaining cost you have to pay given the information you have at a given time. So you are at a given time t. You have observed the common noise up to time little t. And now you see how much you will pay in expectation in the future, given the observation that you have, because you have accumulated some information. But still, the cost, the optimal cost in the future should be adapted or should be measurable with respect to the sigma field that is generated by your observation. And so back to my HJB equation, this is a backward equation. If I randomize in a completely naive manner, this is a disaster because the solution is not is not adapted is not is anticipative on the future of the brain emotion. So, and in fact, this is the reason why this morning I decided to include this FDSDE formulation because I know I knew that for this for this slide this was necessary, and I knew that for this slide this was necessary to introduce a penalization to force the value function to be non-anticipative. So you have standard PDE, 
it becomes a stochastic PDE under the presence of the common noise. And bad luck, if you just randomize naively, this is not the right equation because the solution is anticipative. So you have to penalize exactly as I did penalize uh, this morning, except that maybe uh, this is uh, for the PDE, uh, uh, for the PDE formulation. Okay, uh, a bit of reference. Now these are a little bit more, uh, more difficult results. So we did a book with uh, Cardal Yagel as we uh, and you, you can find this uh, this uh, forward backward formulation exactly in, uh, in this book. And the uh, Cardal Yagel, they, they just released a, a paper a few months ago where they uh, studied this. Uh, um, this SPD, but the, the spirit, I'm going to mention to you uh, the spirit, and then you can go to, the, to these references for more, uh, more results. Okay, so I'm sorry, this is a difficult slide, uh, this one uh, for sure. So the top line, the top line, uh, you should recover the, somehow you recover the, the same equation as the one we had this morning. This is the same. So meaning that if I said the top line being equal to zero, this is the same HIV equation as this morning, except that, as I told you, I simplified a little bit the cost, uh, the shape of the dynamics uh, to uh, simplify the form of the Hamiltonian. Really, really, I, I chose uh, alpha square in the, in the running cost and I chose alpha in the drift so that the shape of the Hamiltonian is very simple. You could try to generalize to more uh, general uh, convex Hamiltonian, but I don't care here. This is not, this is not the purpose. Now you see that eta appears here and here. So when eta is equal to zero, that's fine. This is my equation. Now eta is not equal to zero. I have a common noise. So the very first thing is that I have a penalization. So you see that this is an equation. So this is the unknown u depends on time and x. I compute the solution to a PDE. I am sitting at the point in time and space, and I compute the solution of a PD. So the unknown is a function, and I'm going to penalize this function by means of stochastic integral, exactly as I did this morning. For those of you who do know uh, quite well uh, the uh, stochastic uh, integration theory, just think of this. This is V. I'm going to tell you what was V next, but V times dBT. Basically, we take a time mesh. So you have T0, T1, T2, T3, and so on. And you think of Vt dBt as Vti times the increment Vti plus one minus Vti. So I am sitting at time Ti, and I have a look at the next increment of my Brownian motion. The key point in the stochastic theory integration is that this should be the future increment of my Brownian motion. If I am sitting at a Ti, at time Ti, Ti of the, of the mesh, this should be the increment in the future. So Vti plus one minus Vti. Okay, and if you change, if you do another increment, this is completely different. Okay, so this is the way you should, uh, you should, uh, you should think of this, uh, of this uh, stochastic integral. So V, what is V now? And V, this is, uh, this is the value of the penalty. You find the unique possible penalty so that the solution to the equation gets non-anticipative. The very bad point is that when you do the computation, you realize that in fact, when you introduce this penalty, there is a corrector that appears. Now, this one is much more difficult to explain if you are not probabilistic. If you are not probabilist. For probabilistic, for probabilist uh, people, this is quite easy to understand. You know, you know control theory. Many of you know control theory. There is one standard result in control theory. This is what we call verification theorem. What is verification theorem? You are given a classical solution to the HJB equation. You are given a candidate for being the optimal path. So you solve the stochastic differential equation that is driven by the derivative of the Hamilton Jacobi equation. And you apply Ito's formula, the chain rule. And you check when you apply this formula that it works and you say, fine, this is my verification argument. This is the usual argument. Now you do the same. You do the same in this setting. So you say, I assume that there is a classical solution to this equation. Fine. I assume that it gives me the optimal feedback, which will be a minus the derivative of the solution. I form or I write down what should be the optimal trajectory. 
it will be driven by minus the derivative of u. I apply the chain rule. Very big difficulty because u now depends on an extra randomness. There is not only capital X, the optimal trajectory that is random, there is also the law or the, the state of the population that is random. And you know when you apply Ito's formula that because of the randomness of the arguments, you have to compute the brackets of those arguments because uh, infinitesimally they do not uh, behave uh, very well, they are not of bounded variation. And this is exactly what appears at this level. When you compute, when you compute the, the small variation of u uh, in time, in the verification argument, you are going to pay for the stochasticity of the measure. And so this is what people in probability call Vensel, Ito Vensel term. There is a correction that comes uh, in, your, in your computation. Uh, okay. So this is the shape of the PDE. And really, really keep in mind that there are two unknowns, U itself, but now a penalization. This is a kind of a Lagrange penalization. Uh, this is a way you, to enforce uh, the solution to the, to the equation to leave, uh, uh, to leave uh, in the space of adapted uh, processes. And you call this a stochastic uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So one equation that is backward. This is a backward stochastic equation in infinite dimension. So you see that this is a kind of mixture of between the two things that we did this morning, the PDE formulation and the forward-backward formulation uh, in the stochastic manner. This is really at the uh, uh, interface between the two. Okay, once you have found this, uh, this equation, you say, well, I postulate that the optimal feedback will be minus the derivative of it, provided that the equation has a nice, uh, a nice uh, solution. And I have to compute the marginal law of the SD that is driven by minus the derivative of U. So it means that when you come back to the dynamics of one particle. So if I come back here, it means that I have to replace alpha, this alpha here, by minus the derivative of the value function. And now I wonder about the conditional law of the solution. What is the conditional law of the solution given the realization of the noise? So I had one question, it was a bit more difficult, the question I had this morning, but this, is, this was connected. And in fact, what you know or what you can prove by the same duality argument as the one I explained this morning without common noise, you find that mu is the solution of the stochastic fokker frank equation. So you see, this is the same equation as before, fine, 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 plus a stochastic term. And the stochastic term is exactly this one. And it pays for the fact that the dynamics of mu t are random, and so you have a Fokker Frank equation that is stochastic. So, this is an equation with values in the space of probability measures. And now, what you want to do is to solve this forward, backward system uh, of, the, of, these, uh, of these two PDs. It looks like very much the same as what we did this morning, except for the fact that now mu t is random. And once again, if you try to duplicate the argument that is based or that was, that was based on Schauder, this is very much more a complicated. Uh, because uh, the space, uh, what I call the E uh, now, uh, this, is, uh, this is more difficult to, to find uh, something for which you control the, uh, uh, the topology nicely. So uh, let me take uh, more, a little bit more time and then we have a break. Uh, I just would like to explain to you what I call by a strong solution. So this is just a, a, a way to solve uh, Okay, so let me let me just uh, explain to you what I want to do here. This is a way to recap uh, the two equations that I have to solve. So this is the, the stochastic Fokker Frank equation. So once again, you have in the presence in eta, the eta term tells you, so sigma is equal to one here, sigma is equal to one, and eta is a way uh, to show you the influence of the common noise. So when eta is equal to zero, this Fokker Frank equation, this is the one that we had this morning. Once again, sigma is equal to one to simplify, and eta, this is the intensity of the common noise. And if you tune it uh, to zero, then there is no longer a common noise, and you should be able to recover the same equation as the one we did this morning. And the same for the Hamilton Jacobi equation, eta here, 
here and implicitly here. So if eta is equal to zero, in fact, you don't have uh, you don't have this uh, this uh, dbt term. And I would like to solve this once again by uh, I would like to find a fixed point to this problem, or to say that the solution is regarded as a fixed point. And this is what we did this morning by um, uh, by means of Schroeder theorem. So before I we have a, a short break, uh, let me explain to you uh, the philosophy. If you try to implement Schroeder, this is exactly what I told you. This is too complicated because you want to identify the fixed point for any omega. So you have that in your fixed point condition, you want mu of omega is the conditional law of x given b for the realization of omega. And omega is an element of, of a probability space. So certainly, this is a very big space. And so it means that the space on which you are trying to solve your fixed point is very, very large. And this is difficult because, once again, to find suitable compactness, uh, it becomes very difficult. There is one paper that I did with Carmona and Baker where we say one way to do that is to discretize. We, we discretize the common noise to make uh, the space smaller. Or we saw the, the fixed point and we pass to the limit. This is one way. I'm not going to speak about this. Here, I'm going to speak about something else which is easier. This is a way to get directly existence and uniqueness when you have less reliance monotonicity. And this is something that is absolutely uh, standard in PDE theory. This is what we call the continuation method. I'm going to explain to you the philosophy and then we have a break because I know that this was a lot of stuff. What I'm going to do is to introduce a coupling parameter between the forward and backward equation. If you understood what I said this morning, the spice of these models is that the two equations are coupled and you have conflicting time directions. But if the way you depend on the forward equation and the backward equation is very small, maybe it works. You can make a Picard iteration or Picard fixed point theorem. Uh, uh, so what I'm going to say is that I'm going to input or to, to put a parameter beta here in front of the running cost f. And you see that in the HJB equation, f depends on mu t. So if beta is equal to zero, in fact, there is no longer mu in my equation and I can solve the equation independently of mu. That's fine, I'm happy. But now if I increase beta, then the coupling between the two equations gets larger and larger and certainly this is more difficult to solve. And so the continuation method is a way to say, first, I see what happens when beta is small. And when beta is small, in fact, you can make, uh, you can make uh, a contraction argument it works. And then progressively, you tune step by step beta. Uh, you say, OK, I was able to prove for a small beta that this was fine. I'm going to increase a little bit more. Is it still OK? And you will say, yes, this is still OK. And you do this step by step. For sure, you have to pay a price for this. You cannot, you cannot play with, with this argument in a very, very general manner. But the key point in this argument is to say that if you have the less reliance monotonicity, Instead of proving existence first, as I did this morning, and then uniqueness separately, you can directly do both at the same time by using this continuation argument. So you prove the existence and uniqueness when beta is small, and then step by step, you increase beta to reach beta is equal to 1. This is what I'm going to explain to you after a break. I think that we need to. OK, so I would like to explain to you how to increase step by step this uh, capping parameter beta. So this is just a picture. I know that this is complicated because you have more and more results and maybe more and more strategies. So you just have to make a kind of the small uh, list of possible methods. So what we did this morning without common noise, shoulder, and then for uniqueness. Now we put common noise, and certainly you, you, you have realized that the equations that you have in the end are, are more complicated. So you see that this is now a forward backward system of stochastic. And I think on the fact that this is a way to combine both the PDE formulation that we had this morning and the FDFDE formulation, so the probabilistic formulation. Merge, merge, merge uh, in this uh, uh, system. And I think that's a nice, uh, a nice type of, uh, of equations. And now the next question is. Okay, I'd like to solve directly the solution to this system. Once again, if I have a solution to this system, 
it will be a compromise when n is equal to infinity. This is really what I want. So far, I have not made an n, n is finite. The solution to this system, there should be uh, there should be a compromise with n is equal to infinity. I have been married, but somebody online who has the, the microphone open. Okay, let me move forward. So the very first uh, remark that I'm, I'm going to make is that you can simplify a little bit the forward backward system. So this is something that we used a lot in, in, in the in the results with Pierre, uh, Jean Pierre, uh, Jean Michel, uh, Pierre. Uh, this is uh, this is the fact that um, when you have a model with an additive common noise. You can remove the common noise just by an inner transformation because, because the noise is added. So, so, and this is something that was very, very useful in the analysis. And if the model were more complicated, uh, the analysis would have been more demanding. Um, so, you remove x minus eta, uh, I'm sorry, you, you compute x minus eta bt. So, you remove eta bt to x. And you see that now you are going to say that you really uh, focus on the, on the law or the conditional law of this quantity. So you see that you have tilde notations. I'm, I'm trying to be as, as simple as possible. I don't want to make things uh, too complicated. But if you see a tilde, it means that we have shifted the system by this uh, transformation. So you take mu, and you have, a look, you have a look at the image of mu t under this, uh, this shift. So mu tilde, this is the conditional law of x minus uh, eta bt. And when you do that, if you reformulate, if you remove, and this is the same for u tilde, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, for u tilde, you shift in a similar manner, u, which is the value, you shift that by uh, uh, x plus eta bt. And if you do that, you realize that the forward backward system is a little bit simpler in the sense that you removed, you see, you remove this uh, uh, correction terms that I, I mentioned before, and this is a backward stochastic HJB here. And I remove the noise in the forward equation. So the forward equation is, is a completely standard uh, Fokker Planck equation. And for the backward equation, you just have the fact that this is uh, this is random because of the presence here of the stochastic integral. But the very good point is that you can not exactly, but more or less have a representation formula for the solution to this backward equation by using the, the kernel of the forward equation. So this is something that certainly people from PDE know here is that when you have this equation here, if you forget the drift, for sure you have the, uh, you have the, the, the heat kernel. And this is exactly what I'm doing here. I call P the heat kernel. And I say that I have a representation of the solution in terms of the heat kernel. So the proof of this, uh, this will consist in expanding, in expanding, uh, you see, uh, gamma tilde, this is the boundary condition. And somehow I expand the solution with respect to P S minus T and here S is equal to capital T. And then I expand U tilde acting on the heat kernel and I get a very classical representation formula. The key point, the key point is that here to kill, to kill V tilde, to kill this term, you take an additional conditional expectation. So this is, an argument that is completely standard in the analysis of backward stochastic differential equation, you remove or you, you, you get rid of the stochastic integral by means of conditioning arguments. In fact, if you compute the conditional expectation of this a small amount, this small quantity, if you take the conditional expectation given ft, this is equal to zero just because the fact that dbt is going to be independent of the uh, of the few of um, the past before t and you have the very same thing here at the level of the representation formula and you know that u tilde here this u tilde for a given boundary condition uh, gamma tilde uh, i have this representation formula so it gives me a way to study the equation despite uh, of the uh, despite of the presence of this v tilde there is a way to kill this v tilde this is the the message of this uh, of this slide. So here, this is in the case when beta t is equal to zero. So when there is no noise or when, when there is no coupling, I'm claiming that we can study this equation. This is the, the philosophy. Uh, you can you can you can have access to a representation formula of the solution. 
And so you say now I would like to uh, to increase uh, step by step the value of the coupling. So what I do is that I replace. You see that I replace uh, the presence of f mu. So I put till that just to say that this is after my transformation. If you if you forgot the, the precise meaning, this is not a big deal. You can just keep in mind that tilde the tilde transform is a way to remove the noise in the forward equation and to remove the correction term in the backward equation. So this is just a way to simplify the two equations. Once you have understood this, this is enough for my, uh, for my slides. So this is my new uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation, but there is a very small coupling depending on the state of the population. And I would have, I would like to, to get to study this uh, by using a contraction property, using the previous analysis when beta is equal to zero, so when there is no coupling. So what you do is that you replace this term with mu tilde uh, by a general phi tilde. You say when phi tilde is given, I know that there is an equation. And now I'm going to choose phi, phi tilde as beta <laughs> mu tilde for a given input, and I want to find a fixed point. And so I want to get a contraction. And so the contraction is to say you take two phi, that two phi terms, so one with beta f or f tilde with an input one and another one with an input nu prime. And you do the same for the boundary condition. You say that when you have the coupling beta g tilde, so this is you replace this by gamma tilde, or you choose this gamma tilde for two possible choices of the environment, mu or mu prime, and you want to get a contraction. This is this is what I'm saying. And so the result is that when beta is small, you see that you can compute the distances between the solution of the uh, of the equation in terms. So there is a stability argument here that depends. So this is hidden by my black box, but we can presume what it is. This is the distance between the boundary conditions, and this is the distance between uh, between the, the 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 running cost somehow. So the, the, the two fighter. And so when you let the machinery run, you see that uh, you will have a contraction when beta is small. So if uh, if beta is small, you have the fact that, so this is not exactly what I wanted to say. Forget about this slide. I'm sorry. So no, I'm missing my, uh, well, I'm sorry, this was here. So this was here. Sorry, let me come back here. So when beta is small, by using this, uh, this equation, I'm sorry about this, by using this equation, you get a contraction because you replace phi and phi prime by their values, and you say, well, beta small, and if uh, f is, uh, is uh, smooth enough, then I will have a contraction. So this is basically the way it works. Now you have to do step by step and say you increase beta. So this is the next slide, the, the one to which uh, I, I switched. Uh, so this is, forget for this one, the consequence of monotonicity. Ah, no, this is the, this one, sorry, I have some trouble. So this is this one. So now I know that uh, I have existence and uniqueness for beta small. And the principle of the continuation principle is to say that you can find epsilon that is uniform, whatever the value of beta is zero one, such that if you have existence and uniqueness for a given beta, then you still have existence and uniqueness for a given beta for beta plus epsilon. So if you know how to solve uniquely the system for beta, then the same holds for beta plus epsilon, whatever the value of beta. So it takes a very strong result. And to do that, for sure, you need additional assumption. And once again, this is where monotonicity is going to come in. And just to explain to you the way it works, when you, have, when you are given a beta, uh, in fact, you assume that you have existence and uniqueness not only for beta f nu tilde, but also for the same coupling plus a perturbation. And so you always allow a small perturbation in the in the shape of the hamilton jacobi bellman equation and next when you want to prove existence and uniqueness you are going to choose this small perturbation as epsilon f tilde and the same for the boundary condition gamma tilde will be epsilon f tilde and this will be now inside in this f tilde you will get or you will put an input or you will put a candidate for being uh, the uh, the fixed point but there will be a distinction between the mu that is that is here, which is the solution of the equation for which you have existence and uniqueness as given by the previous value of beta, and the input that you add to the equations uh, so that you want to, to, 
to extend uh, the window on which you have existence and uniqueness. So really keep in mind that this mu here, this mu tilde, this is really the, the solution itself, the solution of the forward equation, whereas the one that you put, you put in gamma tilde and phi tilde, this is really an input. And so you choose two different inputs uh, in, the, in the term phi tilde and the same in the term gamma tilde. And you want to say that once again, when epsilon is going to be small enough, when epsilon is small enough, then you get a contraction. So you see, if I have this, if I'm able to say that I have a contraction, it means that I will have a unique solution, a unique fixed point when I identify the input and the output. And so the output will be mu tilde itself. So I will have the same equation, but with beta replaced by beta plus epsilon. So this is the way it works. And the difficulty, in fact, and, and for sure, this is the, the very key point in the proof, is to prove that the, the value of epsilon can be chosen small enough, but small enough independently of beta. And this is where monotonicity comes in. This is this, uh, uh, these few words that you, you already saw on the slide. So in fact, I, I don't have time enough to explain monotonicity where it comes from, but I presume that you can understand that when beta is small enough, there is no need of monotonicity. When you want to increase step by step, certainly it becomes very necessary. And this is where you need the monotonicity. So I will stop here for the analysis of this system. As otherwise, this would be too complicated and certainly you would, be, uh, you would be lost. I think that the main message you have to remember is that when there is a common noise, this is more demanding for uh, studying existence and uniqueness. And you can directly do so when you have the additional monotoni monotonicity by using this continuation method, which is quite uh, typical uh, for a forward backward system. This is a quite a systematic strategy. And you iterate a contraction argument by increasing step by step the intensity of the coupling between the, the forward and the backward equation. So I think this is, this is enough uh, for the solvability of, uh, of uh, 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 mean field games with a, with a common noise. If you don't have any questions, if you have, for sure, I will answer. But if you don't have any questions, now I'm going to, to jump to the, the, the last uh, part of the day. So I'm, we are going to restart uh, uh, from something that is a little bit different. And, and this will be a way for you to, to, refresh, uh, to refresh yourself. Um, this is what we, we call the master equation. So we got existence, uniqueness, existence and uniqueness in the presence of a common noise. But the key point now is to say, I want to see I want to see the forward backward system that describes the compromise when n is equal to infinity. I want to see that as the characteristics of a PD. If you remember what I did this morning for the, uh, uh, for explaining the Burgers equation uh, together with the, uh, with the forward backward system, this is exactly the same. I gave you a very simple uh, forward backward system and we said, uh, well, in fact, uh, this is the characteristic of a PD. But this was simple because the forward backward system I showed you this morning, x dot is equal to minus y and y dot is equal to zero. This was in dimension one, so this was easy. Now we are in infinite dimension. So wondering about the PDE, uh, a non-linear PDE uh, in infinite dimension. This is the introduction of the, of the solution to the master equation. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to assume now that there is existence and uniqueness for any initial time and initial state of the population, I assume that um, there is a unique equilibrium. So once again, n is equal to infinity and there is a unique equilibrium, a path for any given initial state of the population at any initial time. Okay, I do that. For instance, if you, uh, if you remember what we did this morning, uh, I assume that uh, the coefficients are smooth enough, plus I have some monotonicity. So this is a recap of what we have been doing so far. So uniqueness, it means that if I have an initial time t0 and an, an initial state mu0 for the population, mu t, it describes the state of the population. What is nice is that mu t is uniquely described in terms of t0 and mu0. There is only one equilibrium given the initial state of the population. At the same time, I know what is the shape of the optimal trajectory, or the equilibrium, I should say, equilibrium, sorry, trajectory. The feedback function is given by the derivative of the Hamilton Jacobi equation. If you want, you can remove the common noise. What I'm going to say remains very interesting, even if there is no common noise. 
So you just set eta is equal to zero. This is the sign from the uh, intuitive point of view or philosophical point of view. This is easier, but uh, the, the philosophy is the same. And new, what is new? New, this is the path that is uh, that describes the equilibrium so this is this mu t but once again this is uniquely described in terms of the initial state of the population and what we saw is that mu uh, u sorry the value function was solving a hjb equation forget for the moment the shape of this equation this was a, a complicated nonlinear equation uh in the presence of the common noise if you want to simplify you assume that there is no common noise and so you just take eta is equal to zero and now let me okay so let me remove this uh, this this box I should have a look uh, for tomorrow how to remove that directly and really really focus on this relationship at the bottom of the slide so this is what we are going to call the value of the game so the value what is the value of the game so you say, I am given an initial time, this is T naught. I am given an initial state of the population, this is mu naught. And I am given an initial state for my tag particle in the population. So I am taking uh, one given player in the population. And I'm saying that its uh, uh, initial state is uh, this X naught. And I call the value this calligraphic U. So you see that there is a calligraphic U here. This is what I'm going to call the value at this point and what is the definition of this the definition is i have a look at the value solution of the hjb equation so this is a cost so this is the optimal cost i have to pay when i follow the equilibrium starting from this initial state of the population at this initial time so i am sitting on the equilibrium and then i compute the best cost or the lowest cost starting from t naught x naught so the initial state of the tag player is x naught and the initial time is t naught and it depends on the choice of the equilibrium but the choice of the equilibrium is uniquely determined by the state of the initial of the initial state of the population this is what i'm going to call the value of the uh, of the game okay so <clears throat> what we would like is a pd for this value calligraphic U. So part of the difficulty now is to get an Eulerian description. So we are freezing where we are sitting and we want to define a PD or want to get a PD for this quantity. So we want to get a PD for the value of the game. One way, if you remember your, your lectures in, uh, in uh, uh, optimal control is to have a dynamic programming principle. If you get a dynamic programming principle, you can have a small time expansion in the dynamic programming principle and then get a PD for the value. So here, what I'm saying is that, in fact, if you take initial time, initial state, private state, I'm going to say initial state of the population, you not, what is the cost that you have to pay? Well, this is the cost from the initial time to the end of time, capital T. Then you have the running cost fine and i know what mu t or mu s is this is exactly the equilibrium that i am sitting on and this is the best response when the equilibrium is given so this is the alpha star which is given by the derivative of the hamilton jacobi bellman equation of the solution to it and this is the terminal cost so this is the definition of it now assume that i just make a little piece of time I jump from T0 plus T0 plus epsilon. And I want to see how to express by using the cost of the, the dynamics between T0 and T0 plus epsilon, how to express the value, the value of the game. So I take the formula here, this formula, and I say the value at this, uh, at this uh, initial condition, this is the same. But you see that here, instead of working from T0 to capital T, I'm just stopping at t naught plus epsilon epsilon is very very small so i'm just doing a, a very small piece of time and for sure between uh, t0 or t naught and t naught plus epsilon i have the, the same uh, the same amount the same running cost uh, f and the same optimal uh, feedback 
But then I am missing uh, the rest, and the rest is the integral from T0 plus epsilon to capital T. But what is this? Well, this is how much I'm going to pay when I'm going to restart from where I am at time T0 plus epsilon and where my population is. And so how much do I pay when I restart from T0 plus epsilon the state, the optimal state, x t0 plus epsilon, and the state of the population mu t0 plus epsilon. Well, by definition, this is the value of the game computed at those quantities. And so this is a way to claim that certainly when I have existence and uniqueness, it makes sense to have this dynamic programming principle in the sense that I am able to compute u at a given time in terms of the values of u in a very short future. And now what I'm going to do, well, I'm going to say, let us expand these quantities in small time. When epsilon is small, I'm going to make a small time expansion. And if I make a small time expansion, certainly this will be a way for me to get a PDE for this calligraphic U or for the value of the game. This is the philosophy of the master equation. But now, if you realize, if you do that, you realize that there is a difficulty and technical difficulty, which has nothing to do with mean field games. This, this is just the fact that you have to compute the short time expansion with respect to the major arguments. Somehow you have to linearize uh, with respect to the small variation of the measure. And so you need uh, some differential calculus on the space of probability measures, and which is part of the things that you have to do. So once again, I insist you want to expand this in time. Ah, this is the time derivative. This is easy. In space here, this is Ito's formula. This is the chain rule. This is the proof of the verification argument. Finite dimensional calculus. But this one, this is infinite dimensional calculus on the space of probability measure. And this is one difficulty. OK, so here you need a, a very short uh, reminder of what could be uh, differential calculus on the space of probability measures. There are several approaches to that. Uh, and here uh, I'm going to follow Lyon's approach, so the one he used in his uh, lectures. The idea is as follows. The big problem with the space of probability measures is that this is not flat. This is infinite dimensional plus this is not flat. And so when this is not flat, you have to say what it means to make a perturbation. So what you want to compute, uh, you, want, you want to linearize, what does it mean to linearize? Since, uh, this is not flat. So there are two strategies. The first one is to say, well, possibly I embed my space of probability measures into a space of measures, possibly, and then I make a linear path in the space of measures. This is one way. And there is another way which is regarded as being intrinsic because there is no way, there is no need to extend uh, to the space of measures, which is to say, when you want to, to make a perturbation of a probability measure, you make a linear perturbation in the space of random variables. So what does it mean? It means that when you have a functional, so as before, this is U. This is simpler than the previous U, I have to, to expand this. This calligraphic U depends on time, X, and the measure. Now, to simplify, I'm just saying that this is U of the measure, because I just want to explain to you what is the derivative in the direction of the measure. So there is no need to, to keep T and X. But then next, I have to restore the presence of T and X. So to use random variables, uh, the, the, the approach of Lyons is to say, I'm going to define a lift of my functional. And this lift is called, let's say, u hat. So this is on the top of u. I take a random variable, capital X, and I can compute the image by the lift as u of the law of x. It does exist. I have a random variable. I compute the law. And I compute u of the law. And if I restrict myself to probability measures with a finite second moment, it means that the random variables that I am looking at are in L2. And the very good point with L2 is that this is a Hilbert space. So I know many, many things about it, and I can do fresh derivatives as much as I want. 
And now the next point in the approach of yours is to say, okay, let me see what it means for the lift. You have to be fresh and differentiable. I assume that the lift is fresh and differentiable. What does it mean? So I say, well, well, I assume that the, the or require, if you prefer, I require that U hat is fresh and differentiable. You are in L2. There is a fresh derivative. So the fresh derivative, uh, since you are in L2, you can regard this as an element of L2. Okay. So I can regard the fresh derivative at a random variable x as d u hat of x and d u hat of x is an element of L2. This is also a random variable. Now the question for me is how to compute the realization of this random variable. I am taking a little omega in my big probability space, capital omega, and I want to compute the realization of this random variable at this little omega. And the very nice result is that when you do that, when you want to compute the fresh derivative that depends on x, the realization at little omega, you can use the mean field structure in the following sense. In fact, when you compute at little omega this quantity, to do that, it suffices to know capital X of little omega. I want to compute the fresh derivative at X for the realization omega. And I'm saying that to do that, it suffices for me to know capital X of omega. This is very strong result. And if you want to, to reformulate this, I'm saying that there exists a derivative. So you see that this is partial D in uh, LaTeX uh, or partial in LaTeX. So I call this the Wasserstein derivative. This is absolutely consistent with the derivative in, uh, uh, in optimal transportation uh, using uh, uh, Ambrosio, Gigli, uh, Otto approaches. This is exactly the same object at the end of the day. There is a paper by Gumbo about this. Uh, so this is the Wasserstein derivative. Uh, and so you see that mu here, this is what I'm going to denote of, this is the law of x. So the law of x, I denote it by mu. And I say for any mu, there is a function which is denoted in this way. This is the notation for the derivative. And it takes an additional input, which is a little x in Rd. And so the output is d mu u, computed at mu, computed at x. So, so you have two arguments, the probability measure mu at which you compute the derivative, and the derivative is a function. In fact, if you remember uh, uh, derivatives on the space of probability measures, we know that uh, the derivatives indeed are a gradient of functions on the R. So uh, here, this is a function of x. And now to compute the realization of the fresh derivative, I just have to replace when I put in the left little omega, I just have to replace this little x by capital X of omega. So this is the way I compute the fresh derivative. And for sure, I completely benefit from the mean field structure of u hat to get the shape of this derivative. So this is a very strong result. Really, I insist on this fact. There is a factorization of uh, the Fréchet derivative in terms of a function that only depends on the law of the variable and on the realization at little omega of capital X. And so in the end, you can regard this d mu u of mu. This is a function that is in L2 of Rd when you equip Rd with mu. So the square of the derivative is integrable under mu itself. Very simple exercise. If you want to, to try, you have the following dictionary. You say, okay, okay, this is too difficult for me. What does it mean? I come back to finite dimension. Here is a nice way to come back to finite dimension. I take inputs, x1, x2, x capital N. Think of the position of your particles in the particle system. And with those uh, x1, x2, x capital N, I associate the 
empirical measure or the uniform measure. And I say, I can regard U of the empirical measure. And this is a function of X1, X2, Xn. And I can compute the Euclidean derivatives. And what is the expression of the Euclidean derivatives in terms of the Wasserstein derivative? So this is the formula and you can press the button to have the, the computation. So you take the derivative in the direction Xi, okay? There is one over N, so there should be one over N. This is exactly what you get. There is one derivative, so there is the Wasserstein derivative. What is the measure at which you compute this derivative? This is one over N delta xj. And what is the realization at which you compute this derivative, this function? This is xi itself. So you can do this argument. And if you if you're a bit uh, if you're a bit skeptical about what I'm saying, let me see what you have if you press the button here. Maybe nothing. No, it works. Uh, so you see that. Okay. The very nice point with your new approach is that you can compute the fresh derivative on any probability space that you want. In the end, in the end, this will be the same because we pass from one probability space to another probability space by some, by some mapping. So I say to compute my results, I take theta, a random variable that is uniformly distributed. I'm sorry, there are some typos. Uh, that is uniformly distributed, distributed on one n. So theta, probability that theta is equal to one is one over n. Theta is equal to two is one over n. Theta is equal to n is one over n. So this is uniformly distributed on one, two, three, capital N. Now I say, I compute X theta. X, this is the same vector as before, X1, X2, Xn. And I create a random variable with this, which I denote by X theta. This is random. It is equal to X1 with probability one over N to x2 with probability 1 over n and to xn with probability 1 over n. So what is the law of x theta? Well, this is the empirical distribution uh, uh, that I defined, or this is the uniform measure on x1, uh, x capital N. And I make a very small perturbation of it. And I say, OK, since these are two random variables, I know that it expands as Frechet derivatives. And the first order term will be the Frechet derivative at x theta, which is my random variable, acting on y theta. Very good point. On the space of, in, of uh, random variables, the perturbations are linear. So the, what is the perturbation here? This is just y theta. So the derivative in L2 is acting on y theta. I don't care about the, the remainder. So it, it will disappear when I compute the derivatives. And so keep in mind the shape of uh, the Frechet derivative, what I told you is that the shape of this Frechet derivative, this is the Wasserstein derivative at the law of this guy, so the law of x theta, but I told you that this was a uniform measure on one end, and this is computed at the random variable x theta. So I have this d mu u law of x theta, x theta, acting on y theta. But now this is very easy. Even if you don't like probability, you know how to do that. The probability that theta is equal to i is one over n. So you have one over n to sum over the i's, and you just have to replace theta by i. And now you see that uh, when you have a perturbation in direction yi, you see that the derivative is exactly one over n times uh, this quantity. And so this is your derivative. So you see that this is very easy in some sense because you leave to L2, and this is very convenient uh, for probabilists because we often have random variables. Uh, so we have natural candidates uh, to make the perturbation and so on. And also you have a dictionary to come back to finite dimension. And tomorrow, when we make the connection between mean field games and finite games, these types of formula will be very, very useful because we want to come back to particle system uh, with a finite number of particles on it. Okay, so this is... Uh, this is uh, the proof of this. So uh, once again, this might be something that you could put in your report if you have to make a report. Uh, I think these are nice exercises and maybe it makes connection with things that you saw in the optimal transportation. Okay. 
uh, I recall you. I recall uh, what we wanted to do. I remember. Uh, I recall you what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a chain rule. This was the objective. So uh, very first application is so here. This is an example. Maybe maybe I should say first. This is an example. So a very simple example of you. Depending on the measure, this is a linear functional. So you take a test function h acting on the derivative, on the on the on the measure. So on the measure, you want to compute the fresh uh, the fresh or the Wasserstein derivative. Here. First remark: If I had to compute the linear derivative uh, in the space of uh, sine measures, as I did in fact for uh, for potential gains, I would just linearize and say the derivative is just a test function. This is what I did, if you remember, in the very part, in the very first part uh, today. Now, if I, when I do this, it means that I make linear perturbations on measures, which is not what I'm doing now, because I make linear perturbations on random variable. When I do random perturbation on a random variable, so this, you see that this is, I have two random variables, x and y, and so y is a perturbation acting on x. I have my test function h, and I expand e of h of x plus y. I expand. Inside the expectation, I have to prove that the remainder is uh, fresh and so on, but uh, forget about this. Just uh, focus on the first order term. The first order term, this is given by the usual, by the usual expansion, and so you get a gradient. And so you see that the, the, the derivative appears here. This is the gradient h at x. So it means that your Wasserstein derivative does not depend on u, it only depends on what I'm going to denote by V. And so this is just the gradient of H acting on V. The linear derivative on the space of measures would be H. The Wasserstein derivative is the gradient of H. In fact, this is something that I'm going to repeat uh, either today or tomorrow, I don't know. This is the general connection between the two derivatives. The Wasserstein derivative is always the gradient of the linear derivative on the space of measures. And this is a way to, to re recover the fact that basically this is a gradient in R. Okay. Uh, here, what about the chain rule? I'm just going to check time. Uh, at what time do I have to stop? Uh, this is uh, well, uh, between. Uh, yeah, you have time. It's uh, between half uh, past uh, four to uh, four forty-five. Okay. Between perfect. Perfect. Time. Perfect. Thank you. So back, uh, back to the chain rule. First instance, and maybe you know this from optimal transportation as well. I take a function on the space of uh, a function, an ODE. I take an ODE, and I want to see what is the small time expansion of my functional U on the space of probability measures along the law of the ODE, which is to say that I take an initial condition for the ODE that is mu zero, and I transport. I transport this uh, this initial distribution by the flow of the of the ODE. So it means in, uh, in probability for me, it means that I solve this ordinary differential equation when x naught is random, and I see the law of x t. But this is the same as in that I transport the, by the flow of the ODE. I transport the mu zero, and so I wonder about the small time expansion of u of mu t. I use Lyons uh, Lyons derivative or Lyons approach. This is e. There is no, there is no e here. This is, this is a mistake. There is no e. This is u, this is u hat of x t. So, for, for, forgive me. There is no, no explanation. Um, uh, and here, so when I take the derivative here, now there is an expectation because these are random variables. And so, in small time, I have the Wasserstein derivative at mu because mu is the law of x zero and computed at x zero. And this is acting on what? This is acting on the small time linearization of the ODE. So this is acting on dx0. And so you recover the fact that when you integrate, you get the action in the space L2 mu0 of the velocity field times the Wasserstein derivative. So this is a chain rule. You expand a function, a smooth function, along the flow of measures generated by an ODE or along the laws of an ODE, and you get as first order linearization the 
Wasserstein derivative acting on the velocity field, and then you integrate with respect. So here there should be a new zero. If I put a new zero here, zero is missing here. And so I integrate with respect to new zero. This is almost what I wanted to have in the derivation of my master equation. Almost, not exactly. Because in my master equation, xt, xt has a stochastic term. So it, it must be more difficult because you know that for the chain rule, for the usual chain rule, this is more difficult because I should keep track of the second order term of uh, in Taylor's formula, the other one has. So here I should have the same. So, so now what, what would be, uh, what would be the, the analog? Okay, so very, uh, very few words about the second order derivatives. When you have your first order Wasserstein derivative, you can have a look at second order derivatives. And there are two ways to do that. Either you take the derivative in V, which is one variable in your Wasserstein derivative, or you take a new derivative in mu. But if you take two derivatives in mu, two derivatives in mu, it means that you need another variable because you take the derivative in mu of a function. So each time you have a derivative in mu, you need to increase the number of variables in your derivative. So this is you increase somehow the size of the kernel. Each time you have a derivative in mu, you need another variable to represent the action of the derivatives onto those variables. And for instance, you can do this if you want at home as an exercise. Again, you compute your dictionary because between Euclidean derivatives and second order derivatives on the space of probability matrix. I'm not going to make the proof, but you can have a look at this formula quite quickly. If I compute D2XI, I don't know about this is D2XI XJ, so you differentiate twice. So you will see uh, when you do this, so you have one over M dv d mu and one over n square d2 mu okay and there is uh, for the first one uh, i must be equal to j so so you can do this exercise after. and this is very interesting because it says that they don't have the same order one the first one is of size one over n and the other one is of size one over n square and in particular it says that when i'm going to extend u along the law of the stochastic differential equation i will keep this one but the second one is going to disappear <laughs> so this is what i'm going to see next so you can find this exercise uh, this will be on the slides uh, so so and you can do it uh, quite uh, quite easily uh, using the, the the first order relationship and so now you have this formula this is what i claim so you take so you see that you have a process bt dwt uh, dbt and you want to expand u of mu t where mu t is this is the law of xt so this is the law of xt and so this is another exercise that you can do at least formally and maybe in your report it could be also something that you could put you say i approximate x by a particle system so i just take uh, independent copies this is very simple particle system just independent copies you see this is what i'm doing here i apply standard equals formula in dimension capital n or capital n times d and i pass to the limit and this is what you should have as a very big formula for your channel so u of mu t you will find the action of the drift onto the first order derivative this was the channel room for od you have this dv d mu. This is the one over n that I got in the previous uh, slide. And then here you have, uh, so maybe my formula is, is, is not really good because if, eta, if I had put an eta here, you would have seen that these lines, the last term, sorry, the last term uh, disappears if there is no common noise. So here, this is just because you have common noise but since the intensity of the common noise is one on this slide, you don't really see the impact. So I was stupid when I wrote this formula, but the, the formula is correct, but this is a pity because you don't really see the impact of the common noise. And so in fact, this second order derivative D2 mu, it comes from the common noise. And this one 
you see that it comes from the common noise because you have db. So we have db. So, so the second line, you have to think of this as being a kind of equals formula. So you have a one half and the action of db. And so if you remove the common noise, maybe this is easier for you, you just remove the second line and you, you, you remove the conditioning by b. The conditioning by b, this is absolutely normal because you expect everything to be conditional on the realization of the common noise. Okay, so you have set your, you have set your, your, uh, you obtain your ethos formula. You come back to the dynamic programming principle. So this was a long time ago in our discussion. So you come back to this slide, you expand. This is a bit more difficult because uh, now uh, it depends on time and on X. Okay, anyway, you can do that in a quite uh, similar manner. You can do it if you want as an exercise when eta is equal to zero, when there is no common noise. So, so when there is no common noise, this one is completely deterministic. So uh, this is pretty, pretty easy to, to generalize the formula. And you say, when you do the expansion, the small time expansion of this, well, it should give me a zero by dividing both sides. So first I'm going to remove the initial boundary condition. So the value of this at time when epsilon is equal to zero is going to cancel with the left-hand side. Then I divide by epsilon and I obtain the PDE. And this is the shape of the PDE. It's very complicated PDE. You will see, you will see more about it tomorrow. Uh, at this stage, it looks to be uh, very horrible. I'm going to, 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 to to give you a few words about it. You will see tomorrow that you can, you can have a more, maybe a, a more intuitive uh, uh, reason why you should get this thing. Anyway, this is the value of the game. So the time derivative, this one, the very first one is, it comes from the action of the optimal feedback. Here, this is the optimal feedback acting on the derivative with respect to the Weierstrass measure. So this is the chain rule for the ODE, so this is the velocity field. Somehow it says that the velocity field at the equilibrium is minus the derivative of U, minus derivative in space. This second line is exactly the HJB equation. And then the third terms, that the three uh, other terms that you have, you are paying for the presence of the noise and for the mean field. So this is related to the uh, chain rule formula uh, uh, for an ETO process. And in particular, if eta is equal to zero, Maybe this is easier for you. If eta is equal to zero, you get rid of uh, this, uh, these last two lines. And so the equation, you just have the, the three first uh, lines in the equation. So this is a bit easier. So maybe you could say at this stage, well, this is very difficult for me. I don't see what is the purpose of that. Tomorrow, I will show you how you can use this equation really to get information about the rate of convergence of the particle system to the limit. And so this is something that is absolutely interesting using the fact that you have a classical solution to this equation. So this is your limiting object. Use the fact that you have a classical solution to the equation with the nice properties on the solution. It gives you information about the way the, the, the solution or the equilibria to the finite particle system, the way they do converge uh, to the limiting system. So this is something that is, you, you get some information from the analysis of this system. Um, okay, so I don't want to, to enter too much in the detail. The big question uh, was, uh, is or was is still about the solvability of this equation. Uh, so let's say that this is, this was, uh, this is still, this has been a, an interesting question in the field. And the very first results, so Lyons uh, gave uh, many, many arguments in his talk, uh, in his lectures at the Collège de France in the book uh, that I mentioned before, uh, somehow we expanded all the arguments. And the main result that we proved is that you have classical solutions, so the derivatives really exist and make sense, when the coefficients are smooth enough in X, in the direction of the measure, and you have monotonicity. So the same monotonicity condition than the one I mentioned for uniqueness, it gives you stability, and stability in the sense that uh, there is no blow up in the uh, in the equation. So this is exactly the analog of what I told you this morning for burgers. So when you have this uh, monotone profile, uh, there is no blow up. In fact, yeah, this is exactly the same. The solution uh, behave well. 
now there are several directions uh, at this time uh, so you can try to relax the, um, the regularity conditions on the coefficients but still keep monotonicity and so you have more, more and more results in this direction and for instance uh, Charles Bertucci who is member of the CEMAP is one specialist of this question uh, and other uh, other possible works uh, and I will uh, maybe I will speak a little bit about it tomorrow is to try to uh, to remove the monotonicity assumption, but use other uh, structure condition on the on the problem to be able to define a solution to this equation, even if the derivatives do not exist uh, in a classical sense. Okay, so the, the very last part of the slide. So uh, I, I should. So this is these are typical conditions that you can find in the literature. I don't want to de to, to explain this in detail. The philosophy is that if this is smooth. Enough, and if this is monotonous, then it works. This is uh, just the philosophy of it. So these are the details, but uh, uh, no need uh, no need to go further. So the, um, the the very last part of this uh, of this lecture today was about proving proving the existence of uh, uh, of a classical solution. And so this is in fact so once again as i told you this was a difficult question so i don't know how far i will, I will enter the detail i will just give you certainly uh, the very uh, the very main idea and then uh, this will be enough and we will stop for today so just a summary uh, we started from the value of the game the value of the game when there is existence and uniqueness so this is how much you have to pay when you know your private state and the state of the population I told you we have a dynamic programming principle. I should make a small time expansion. To do that, I need differential calculus on the space of probability measures. I get a chain rule. Once I have a chain rule, I have a PDE. And now uh, this is a question that you can understand. Is there a classical solution to this PDE? And I told you yes. If I have uh, um, smooth enough conditions plus, uh, plus monotonicity. So very quickly, how does it work? Uh, there are several proofs uh, for, for, the, for the existence of the classical solutions, but let's say that basically the, the philosophy is always the same. Now there are plenty of ways to write down the proof, but it works uh, more or less always in the same way. If you know PDE quite well, the analysis is to come back to the characteristics. And so if you think of a transport PDE and you, you think of the or nonlinear PDE, but this would be the same for a transport PDE, and you come back to the characteristics, you want to prove the smoothness of the solution by coming back to the characteristics and by proving some regularity on the characteristics themselves. And this is exactly what you want to do here. So we you represent you represent the solution here. So this is your your the candidate for being the solution and you want, you want to prove it to be smooth in fact once you know that this is smooth you get the solution the difficulty here is to, is to get the smoothness when you know once you know that the value function is, is smooth in the direction new or the value of the game is, is smooth in the direction new this is fine once you have smoothness necessarily you should have the equation itself so the difficulty is not to prove the equation this was a the chain rule that I mentioned, the difficulty is to have smoothness of the value of the game. This is not the smoothness in X that is difficult, because in X, if you remember the, the, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, in X, uh, you, you have the Laplace in the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, so certainly this is not the difficulty. What is more difficult, this is the regularity in the direction. And so to do that, you want to come back to the representation of the value of the game as or in terms of the solution of the AJB equation, when you have initialized the flow of probability measures at mu zero itself, you want to prove that you want to prove that there is a derivative, and so you want to make a perturbation of this derivative of this initial condition and prove that you can linearize the response of your system. So it means that I'm going to make a linear perturbation of the measure and I want to prove that I can linearize the response or the value, which means that there is a derivative. If you think of a derivative, this is exactly what you do. You take your initial point, you make 
a small perturbation and we linearize the value. And I want to do the same here. So I take a, a, a measure, I make a small perturbation, and I want to make a small time, a small extension with respect to the perturbation. And this will give me uh, basically the existence of a derivative. So just to explain to you, this is taken from the book uh, with the Cardale Agel as Fiennes. We did, and this is maybe uh, the interest for you, we did convex perturbation of measures. I told you before that you could do linear perturbation in the space of probability measures, but I also told you that you could have linear perturbations in the space of measures and not in the space of random variables. And here we did perturbation on the measures themselves. This is the analog of making linear perturbations in the space of signed measures, except for the fact that in order to stay within the space of probability measures, we did convex perturbation. So you take a measure mu and you make a convex perturbation by a probability measure mu prime. And since this is a convex combination, it remains a probability measure. And so you make a perturbation with a small amount epsilon, and you want to prove that this derivative does exist. If you can do this, that's fine, it works. It means that this object is differentiable with respect to the derivative that is con with, with the convex perturbation. Then you have to make the connection with the Wasserstein derivative, but I told you before, the linear derivative in the space of measures is a potential of the Wasserstein derivative. So we know that there is a strong connection between the two of them. So just, uh, yes, one, one last slide and then, and then I will stop. Uh, no, not this one I want. Yes, for those of you, just for those of you who want to, to, to who are interested in this question, this is the connection between Wasserstein derivative and derivative in the space of measures. So uh, uh, the fact that the second one is a potential or the first one is a derivative of the second of the first of the second one. So here I, I put you the results and, and this is corrected uh, if you press on the button. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this was just to explain to you the lines of the proof, but I just want to, to explain to you the, 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 the main, just the main arguments. So I guess we are all tired and uh, I, I will stop. So this is exactly the linearization argument. You start from your system HGB equation, Fokker Planck equation, and then you make a convex perturbation here, this is here, a convex perturbation of the initial condition of the forward backward system, both for the, for sure, you make a, a perturbation and you have the impact on both the solution to the Fokker Planck equation and the AJB equation. And you want to prove that there is, there is a derivative when the perturbation uh, tends to zero. And the claim is to prove that it satisfies a, di a differentiated a derivative system, a derivative forward backward system. So formally, you come back to the Fokker Planck equation, HJB equation, you take formally the derivative in the system, you prove that this is uniquely solvable and that it must be the derivative of these uh, two quantities when epsilon tends to zero, or the derivative at epsilon is equal to zero. So the strategy is to say, you compute the formal derivative in your characteristics, you get a differentiated system, you prove that this is uniquely solvable and you prove that the solution now is indeed the derivative of uh, the two perturbated uh, Fokker Planck and HJB equation. And to prove that the derivative system is uniquely solvable and that this is indeed the derivative of these quantities, you need, mo you need monotonicity because monotonicity once again gives you some stability. So you can go further the, into the reading of the slide, but this is exactly what I, I wanted to say. Certainly I was, uh, I was a, little bit, a little bit slow in the afternoon, so I think better to stop, but if you, if you carry on the reading tonight or uh, any time uh, next, this is exactly the arguments. And then I think that this is the end. Uh, this is the end of the proof. So I think this is better for me to stop. Or for the ones who are at distance, you can feel free to ask any questions from the desk. Sure. Please. Just because, uh, the problem the equation is about Question is: Is there uh, any notion of generalizing in sense in the viscosity sense? And do we use test functions? Do we use viscosity type techniques like variable doubling or what are these types of techniques? Okay. So.
so th these are very interesting questions. So um, maybe for those of you who are online, so the question was about uh, possible generalized solution to the master equation. So for viscosity solutions, this is an open problem. The very first thing is that if you think of viscosity solution, this is more adapted to Hamilton Jacobi. Here, the master equation is not a Hamilton Jacobi equation. If you want to have a Hamilton Jacobi equation, you have to come back to mean field control. If you remember what I said on the very first part of this lecture today, uh, this is a, a control problem. So you should have a Hamilton Jacobi equation for this one. And then you could wonder about viscosity solutions. And even this, the theory is not clear at this time. The difficulty is that we know how to get existence of a form of a class of a viscosity solutions, but for uniqueness, this is more difficult in the choice of the test function. So far, there is no cheap theory. So this is one first thing. Now for the master equation, this is more difficult because formally, formally, if you think of the potential case, which is the one that I told you before, so you have the Pontry eigen principle between a, a mean field control and a mean field game. Formally, it means that the master equation is the derivative of the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation on the space of probability map. So you can understand that if this is difficult to solve the Hamilton Jacobi, this is even more difficult to solve, um, to solve the master equation. So in this direction, this is something that I'm doing now with uh, Aleko Chekin, who was, uh, was postdoc here for a long time, and he was in this before, uh, and now he, he came back to Italy. And we try to say, to do this, uh, to define a notion of a generalized solution to Hamilton Jacobi, and then to take a derivative and to say that uh, possibly you have a, a generalized solution to the master equation. It seems to be working, but the, the paper is not yet enough. Now, as I said before, back to the master equation, since this is the derivative of Hamilton Jacobi, you can think of the master equation as a kind of infinite dimensional hyperbolic system. So even in finite, dimen finite dimensional hyperbolic system, these are difficult. So even infinite dimensional, these are difficult. So you have this potential case when it, it, it comes from the Hamilton Jacobi equation, this could be one way. But you have to understand that there could be plenty of cases when your main field game is not a potential game. The potential game is, was just an instance I gave you before to make the connection between the two main field control and main field game. But there are plenty of main field games which are not the Pontryagin of mean field control. So for this one, certainly, we are very, very far from being able to say something. And so what people are doing, this is more trying to decrease the required smoothness, but keeping uh, using uh, monotonicity. And this is not exactly viscosity solution. Certainly, uh, in the works of uh, Bertucci, who is another uh, person here in, uh, in CEMAP, um, he used a notion of test function, but this is not exactly the same as in as in monotonicity as in viscosity solutions. There are things that are reminiscent, but I could not say that this is exactly the same as uh, as um, as in viscosity solutions. So, indeed, you decrease you decrease the, the required smoothness by playing with suitable choice of test functions. But what he does really uses uh, monotonicity. So, just to summarize what I said. At this time, there could be some works in the potential case. You take the derivative of Hamilton Jacobi. Possibly, this could be a way to generalize or to have generalized solution to the master equation. Or you use monotonicity. And then uh, you have the works of Bertucci. I cannot say that this is exactly viscosity solutions, but there is a way to use some test functions in the story to define a notion of solution, even though you don't have uh, classical derivatives. So I think this is. Uh, Yes, this is what I could say. But these are really works in progress. So, so this is a, an active field at this point. Uh, just a follow-up question. The, the, so I imagine if you have a new generalized solution, you have to use the, the square plus of time distance, maybe. Even if you want to define the notion of subdivergence, for example. But it's not, the square plus of time distance is not differentiable in the real sense. Mm -hmm. So how do we get around that? Just I'm getting technical. No, no, but once again, so 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 far, if you really go to, to viscosity solutions, uh, the notion of uniqueness, uh, this is not complete. So 
there are some works by FAM, for instance, and what he does is that he uses test functions but on the space of random variables. And indeed, as you say, you get some troubles when you try to project back this onto the space of uh, onto the space of probability measures. So I don't have an answer to your question, but there is no complete theory in this direction. So I don't have an answer to your question. And in the works you have, to the best of my knowledge, because I, I may miss uh, things for sure. Um, the results that we have when you have uniqueness, indeed, there are some difficulties in the choice of the test functions. And the existing works, you, you choose uh, test functions in the L2 space of random variables to avoid these kind of difficulties. But then the notion of solutions that you have in the end is not intrinsic. So, so I cannot say that this is um, the theory is complete. I'm sorry, my, my answer is partial, but the knowledge is partial. Uh, no other questions. So let's talk again for the day. And uh, let's meet again tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning.